Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the discussion on our results for the year ended March 31 to 2020. Our results, including the investor presentation, press release, and regulatory disclosures, are already available on our website, as well as that of the stock exchanges. I have with me Suresh Badami, Executive Director, Neeraj Shah, CFO, Srinivasan Parthasarthi, our appointed actuary, and Kunal Jain from Investor Relations. I will run through the key highlights of our FY20 results and would be happy to take questions post that. Starting with an update on the current situation. As a result of this pandemic, human lives have been disrupted and organizations around the world are witnessing challenging times. As a responsible corporate citizen, the safety and well-being of our employees, customers and partners and ensuring uninterrupted service to our customers are our foremost priorities. The impact of the outbreak has been seen across both new business and renewal collections, with customers wanting to conserve cash till clarity emerges. While it might take some more time for things to settle down and a new normal to emerge, we believe that the structural story for insurance remains intact and we expect business to emerge stronger at the end of this pandemic. Our existing suite of digital assets has enabled us to continue providing a seamless experience to the end customer from a new business and servicing perspective. On the servicing front, adoption of our digital servicing avenue has seen an overall increase of 67% during the lockdown period, while usage of our bots across WhatsApp, Twitter, and web has increased by 70%. We have settled around 3,000 maturity claims around 300 death and health claims, made nearly 21,000 annuity payouts, and processed close to 95,000 transactions in the first 15 days of lockdown. With regards to new business, we have seen a jump in the adoption of assets such as chat-based identification tool, pre-conversion verification chat, which allows customers to self-authenticate their details. Our virtual frontline sales model, WISE, enables our sales representatives to connect with customers via video calling and complete the sales process. Next, on business performance. While there was disruption in the last 10 days of March, we have been able to exhibit steady performance and delivery across all key metrics in FY20. We grew by 18% based on individual and overall APE, covering over 6.1 crore lives in FY20. Overall new business premiums have grown at 15% in FY20, leading to a market share of 21.5% amongst private players. We grew by 19% based on individual WRP compared to private industry growth of 5% and overall industry growth of 6%. This led to a 170 basis points increase in market share from 12.5% in FY19 to 14.2% in FY20. We maintained our leadership position in the group segment with a market share of 29%. Our new business margin for FY20 was 25.9%, an increase of 130 basis points over the same period last year. Value of new business grew by 25%, increasing from Rs. 1,537 crores in FY19 to Rs. 1,919 crores in FY20. A sharp fall in interest rates during the year led to lower EV unwind. This, coupled with strengthening of our persistency and mortality assumption, resulted in our operating return on embedded value reducing by 200 basis points to 18.1% compared to 20.1% last year. In anticipation of the possibility of worsening mortality due to COVID-19, we have created a COVID reserve, the adequacy of which would be reviewed at regular intervals. Our profit after tax saw a marginal increase over the previous year to Rs. 1,295 crores. This is after providing Rs. 106 crores for the Yes Bank 81 bonds held by us. New business train was offset by our robust back book surplus, which grew by 17%. Our solvency position remains strong at 184% compared to 188% a year ago, with the drop being due to fall in equity markets. We have received board approval to raise Tier 2 capital via subordinated debt. 
It is an enabling resolution and the extent and timing of the fundraise will be assessed in due course. The subject would provide greater ability to increase our protection business and additional cushion against further market volatility. Additionally, in line with the IRDI circular to conserve capital, we have not declared any dividend for FY20. Next, on channel performance. The share of proprietary channels has increased to 36% in FY20 from 32% in the previous year. We remain focused on strengthening our relationship with all our bank assurance partners, including HDFC Bank, and maintain our market share with HDFC Bank. Additionally, our broker channel crossed the milestone of rupees 500 crores APE, growing by more than 1.5x over FY19. We continue to diversify our mix beyond the traditional modes of distribution and have deepened our relationships across to 70 partners, including more than 40 in the new ecosystem space. Moving on to the product performance, our focus on maintaining a balanced product mix has helped us weather multiple business cycles and we continue to actively pursue the same. Our savings business grew by 18%, while protection grew by 22% in FY20. We continue to address longevity risk for customers through our annuity and long-term income proposition. Protection remains a key focus area for us and accounted for 27.6% of our business in terms of new business premium and 17.2% on weighted premium basis. Individual term protection was at 7.6% of individual APE and grew by 33% over the previous year. 13th month persistency has improved from 84% to 88% and 61st month persistency has improved from 51% to 54% for individual business. We continue to monitor persistency in this difficult period for customers, especially for the ULIP segment. We have also strengthened our assumptions in anticipation of any weakness in persistency. To conclude, we believe that while there are challenges in the short term, as detailed in our IR presentation, there would also be opportunities in terms of increased demand for protection, inorganic growth, and a flip to our reimagining insurance framework, such as work from home and offering innovative digital solutions to customers. We are preparing for multiple scenarios to pan out this year and will dynamically review and react with agility as events unfold. We endeavor to protect our downside risks while staying well poised to spot demand revival as the devastation caused by COVID-19 recedes. The detailed disclosure on our results is available in our investor presentation. In the end, I would like to thank all of you for your continued support of our company and hope that you and your family stay safe. We are happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question, you may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Suresh Ganpati from Macquarie Capital Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, we've got two questions. Uh, one is on the uh, any anecdotal uh, thing which you can share with us as to how the how uh, what is the on the ground feedback with respect to how people are reacting to this COVID-19 situation? Is there a demand for a higher summit or are more inquiries picking up? Are companies asking for more uh, you know cover for their employees? Anything that you can share with? Yeah, hi Suresh. Uh, yes, certainly. So some things are coming out very clearly. Um, so while if I were to look at March last 15 days and the degrowth um, that all of us witnessed, however, my online channel in the same period grew 13%. So uh, against the degrowth in the month of March of 28%, my online channel grew by 13%. Similarly, I'm seeing a term APE uh, growing. Uh, and again, just for the standalone month of um, March, my term share was 10% as against an overall annual share of about 8%. Uh, so that too, again, um, is showing, again, intuitively, that's what you would expect and that's what we are seeing. We're also seeing um, slightly smaller ticket size emerging. So people are somewhat reluctant, again, understandably, to have an outlay of, um, of you know, higher ticket sizes. Another aspect is that we are getting a lot more inquiries on group term insurance uh, from lots of employers. 
unfortunately this is not the time only to cover covid um, it needs to be a more holistic level of coverage that employers should be looking for uh, for all their employees um we are also looking uh, uh, no reduction for example in annuity business um we are also not seeing that much of a reduction in some of our non part business uh, which is a lot more of in fact it augurs well when people think that the um you know everything is just doom and gloom um, but clearly unit link is not favor of the season and uh, hasn't been for a while and it's just deepened in terms of uh, people staying away from that and from the market so i think this is what largely we are seeing suresh uh, what we're also seeing another aspect is that customers are after uh, refusing to engage at all um, or prospective customers are now somewhat willing at least in some of the geographies that are showing signs of ending the lockdown ending apart from the metros we are seeing uh, willing to engage in conversation about slightly uh, lower ticket sizes okay and can you ask someone to explain the page 22 of your presentation which is the milman report on alm approach because i have some clarifications uh, which certainly. i want yes yeah. certainly neeraj you want to yeah. have a yes rish uh, yes, so this hi. is uh, uh, basically uh, uh, milman had actually reviewed our alm approach uh, as what we've uh, mentioned uh, last time on the call as well uh, what you see on page 21 is our overall risk management framework and uh, what you see on page 22 is a summary of uh, what milman has put out uh, what the scope of the review is uh, to basically uh, assess appropriateness of the alm strategy for the north part business that business as you're aware uh, has uh, two portfolios the first one is uh, the non par savings and the credit protect portfolio which is portfolio 1 and the second one is uh, all our uh, all our annuity business which is both uh, immediate and deferred so if you were to just go back on page 21 at the bottom what you will see is that uh, our embedded value and vnb sensitivities to interest rate or the overall book have been laid out you can compare it with what we've uh, disclosed in the past as well and uh, both on embedded value as well as on vnb margin the sensitivities are fairly contained and uh, on the non par book we put it uh, next to that uh, what we've mentioned last time as well is that uh, uh, sensitivity or dollar duration is basically uh, something that helps you manage small changes in interest rate without any slope change what would be more appropriate for a liability like uh, regular premium non par savings would be cash flow matching which will not just cover small and parallel shifts in yield curve but also slope changes and uh, larger changes and convexity as well so that's where cash flow matching becomes so important so we are happy to take a little more sensitivity in terms of uh, dollar duration if we are able to get a good cash flow match so that's what uh, is there on page 22 as well so the stresses that we've actually tested are over and above what we showed you on page 21 which is a 1% interest rate up and down if you look at the scenarios the first one is basically 150 basis points uh, shift in this interest rate up and down the second one is combining this interest rate variation with changes in persistency in mortality experience and the third one is the this of all guarantees being called in with 100% persistency and interest rates dropping sharply over the next uh, few years so just uh, about 4% for the next 5 years then dropping to 2% for the next 5 years and then 0% thereafter even in that situation the net asset position remains positive so what this uh, exercise was meant to do was to validate our approach and also give comfort both to management team our board as well as to investors that uh, this uh, approach is appropriate not just in terms of ensuring that uh, policy holder liability cash flows are protected but also limiting the impact on the shareholder value okay so the gap is positive throughout right neeraj 4.5% 7% the gap still remains positive in the first two scenarios also yeah of course it's positive for sure but the change yeah. is also fairly contained yeah right? okay. yeah okay yeah, thanks so much yeah. thank, thank you thank you the next question is from the line of prakash kapadia from anivet portfolio management the managers private limited please go ahead yeah thanks for the opportunity i had you know two questions uh, do we have you know any arrangements with you know uh, some vendors to ensure you know renewals for our existing policy holders or some back to back arrangements 
because you know these are tough times so any such uh, arrangement yes. is there yeah. when you say arrangement yes we we have for uh, a loan or some mismatch yeah so on a loan uh, apart from unit linked we are able to give a loan against policy especially after two or three premiums have been paid and there is uh, some level of current value that is uh been formed up so against that we regulations permit us to give a loan it is an over the counter loan and can also be uh, repaid by the policy holder once that immediate cash flow stress scenario eases off um so we are uh, telling our policy holders that rather than uh, uh, surrendering or or uh, lapsing their policy why don't you take a temporary loan in case you think that uh, you know unsure of the cash flow situation and then uh, you can always uh, close the foreclose the loan uh, there is no minimum tenor you can foreclose the loan and uh, so that's something that we're doing what unfortunately we can't uh, say is for unit linked uh, policy holders uh, regulations earlier used to permit that uh, it that's no longer the case okay okay so this is excluding the unit portfolio that's correct yes and how do we charge on the what is the interest rate for the tenure it is tenure. cheaper than taking a personal loan quite cheap quite much cheaper than a personal loan and you know uh, there have been talks and you know discussions that IRDF for a health product so how different is that product which you know stand alone health insurers currently offer and uh, what is the advantage if you know a life insurance company have to do it yeah so we also as a life insurance company uh, we used to be allowed to sell health indemnity uh, products uh, but that was withdrawn a few years ago uh, our limited point is that um, the health opportunity has is very very underpenetrated um, so largely if you were to look at we, india has one of the highest Uh, rates of out of pocket spending in healthcare almost 70% um and when you look at uh, some of the even emerging markets uh, is a lot more coverage is there so our our humble submission is is too strong one is that penetration really uh, is still very very low so the pie really hasn't uh, expanded so we would like to help expand the pie and second is product innovation uh that if you're allowed health indemnity then uh, we can also have product innovation where we can uh, ramp down life cover ramp up health have health savings account wrapped around health indemnity and so on and and third is the ease for the customer because we need to put the customer in the center of everything uh, and that is if he goes for medicals once then you know i can just with very little pain to the customer i can give him uh, a, a more comprehensive cover so all of that means that it makes eminent sense and it is just uh, too premature for com- for different parts of in- insurance sectors to say that uh, you know this somebody will do and not do i think really keeping all these things in mind uh, that's our appeal as a industry okay. and if we on the board approval for tier 2 is it what due to covid or the provision which you mentioned because of yes bank or reducing reinsurance for higher growth what's the objective of this fundraise so no it, it is an, um, really um, not nothing specific it's something that we have been toying with uh, even uh, towards the end of february uh, it's uh, essentially that you know our uh, uh, solvency ratio has been hovering uh, we ended at 184% it was 188% so it's, it's been hovering around uh, 190% and thereabouts Uh, we have said that as a board approved policy at 170% we will have to uh, think about raising capital although even at 170% it is uh, a fairly comfortable situation but nevertheless so given that and given the equity market fall so our solvency has been impacted uh, by about 10% uh, due to the equity market fall not specifically uh, um, the 81 bonds or something so it is a overall uh, generic fall that we have uh, witnessed of about 26% um as a result uh, we thought that when green shoots start appearing and hopefully it's not that far away then we should not be strapped because imagine a situation wherein um lockdown progressively starts um um disappearing uh, in non metros uh, but at the same time equity mark uh, uh, market remain extremely volatile so there is a pressure on solvency but demand is also there and that situation is not entirely inconceivable and hence we thought that um 
so for growth growth capital especially from protection point of view it this is the it makes a lot of sense to just uh make one's uh, capital position and balance sheet little bit more robust but even today we are uh, in a comfortable situation and the final point is you know uh, when you separate out economic solvency versus a uh, factor based or a rule based solvency economic uh, solvency is uh, even more comfortable role or a risk based solvency understood that's helpful thanks i'll come back with more questions thank okay. you thank Bye. you Before we take the next question, a reminder to the participants: please limit your questions to two per participant. Should you have any follow-up request, should you rejoin the queue, please. The next question is from the line of Ajax Frederick from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, ma'am. Thanks for the opportunity. My my questions are uh, uh, pertaining to protection. So we have been hiking protection prices at the far end, like one crore plus kind of uh, summer shirt. uh whereas our competitor has been hiking prices on the lower end of uh, summer shot and as you have pointed out our uh, recent scenario was tilting customers towards lower ticket sizes so will this impact our demand in protection sales retail protection sales going forward so you know for us uh, we have never been uh, the cheapest just for the reason that uh, that tends to be a very dangerous game India has had one of the lowest levels of uh, term prices, and when you look at uh, when you move towards interior uh, India, and whether that will be any sustainable, uh, one has to be very cautious about it. And plus, the limited amount of uh, KYC that is available for us to do any risk-based monitoring. Um, so even before we uh, reinsurance pricing and after, I think we we haven't really wavered that much. I think we need to price it at a a sensible level wherein the mortality risk that we see emerging especially um are something that we are able to cover uh, so to your question i think uh, we will uh, have to stay competitive no question about it but at the same time we don't want to carry uh, the kind of risks on our balance sheet that we either don't understand or we are very aggressive uh so uh, margin impact is not there that's what you are trying to say here you have passed on all the reinsurance uh, rate hikes completed with us someone no uh, that is not the case with us um we will still be competitive and not necessarily pass on all the increases but we will find other ways of uh, ensuring that we are margin neutral okay okay and uh, just one more question ma'am on uh, uh, servicing clients through video calling uh, so uh, uh, how many clients i mean my question was more with respect to the sourcing side so how many clients are okay to do a uh, a uh, chilly medical or has a shift uh, are you seeing a shift dramatically on ground yes we are seeing a pretty major uh, shift on the ground so if you were to look at uh, chilly medical itself uh, earlier before covid it was covering and i'm just going back in time start of fy20 it was about 8 to 10% that went up to 24% today we are trending at almost uh, 55% of chilly medical in volume terms it has gone up by 50% so a uh, tele medicals along with a lot of uh, data analysis and making sense of the data that we already have as well as embracing it uh, with the data that is available legally available um, means that we are able to separate out and understand risks a lot better and hence uh, be able to increase the amount of tele medicals so this is going to be a ongoing thing so it's not just a covid related thing that we are relaxing something for covid that's something that we would stay away from okay and then final question on uh, uh, again covid uh, since uh, not only us most of the private players have good exposure to maharashtra and bombay uh, during our stress testing have we factored the, those things into our mortality risk the eating yes, very things much yes yeah, so, um, i can pass it on so, so you know we we set up a a covid reserve covering about 4500 odd lives shini you want to give a uh, some color on how we went about that yeah uh, so um the way we went about setting up this uh, covid reserve is um uh, we sort of mapped the actual covid cases across the geographies um versus our own uh, lives uh, that are spread around the country and uh, uh, sort of you know saw where all the call pockets are more exposed and accordingly we come up with a number Uh, uh where you know we think uh, uh, we can sort of provide for an extra 400 400 uh, sorry 4500 lives uh, 
um, you know, over and above the normal um, mortality that you would experience. Uh, and, you know, that translates to about uh, 40 odd crores uh, in, in terms of reserving. Uh, so, I think that there is a lot of science gone behind whether, you know, it's a group product and the individual and whether it's metro and, uh, you know, uh, or uh, uh, town B or C. So, you know, a lot of analysis has been, draw, has been sort of uh, done and we have mapped the entire uh, geography of, you know, of the country and across uh, with the actual number of lives that we've returned, uh, uh, considering both the individual as well as the group protection products we've returned um, in, in the last few years. And thereby arrived at this number of 4,500 extra uh, lives that can be covered through this uh, uh, additional reserves. Perfect, sir. Thanks, thanks a lot, sir. That was very helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. The next question is from the line of Sumit Kariwala from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Just wanted to get some color with respect to change in operating assumptions during the year and also some color on uh, operating variants, what came down, what went up uh, for fiscal year 20. Srini, why don't you uh, give me? Yeah. See, uh, operating uh, assumption, uh, you would have seen in that uh, investor deck that the operating variance uh, has been largely positive. Uh, but in spite of that, uh, we've gone about uh, strengthening the assumptions, uh, mainly on the back of uh, the COVID scenario. Uh, we've um, primarily strengthened our persistency assumption across all cohorts, I mean, uh, across all segments, you are participating in non part because we don't know what uh, the customer's propensity to pay would be. Uh, but uh, like I said, the operating variance is largely positive. Um, uh, it's only because of uh, the COVID that we sort of set up these additional uh, prudence in the assumptions. Um, and they are mainly centered around uh, persistency uh, for the three signals I mentioned. Uh, mortality is by and large fairly neutral, and uh, the COVID result that we set up uh, is the only extra bit that we set for mortality. Okay, so what would be 13-month uh, persistency assumption per units in your, um, as, of, as of fiscal 20 now? The actual experience you would have seen in some many of the slides we've shown, the actual experience is around uh, 88%, Three, I think. Yeah. 80, um, yeah, Unit yeah, yeah, so 83. Um, so, but we have uh, strengthened it uh, fairly sharply uh, from 83. Um, and we just wanted to wait and watch. And if everything moves normal in the first quarter, uh, you know, few quarters, then we'll probably unwind those uh, prudence uh, from the persistence assumptions. Because just to interrupt, Sumit, we are seeing uh, cash conservation, like I mentioned in my opening comments. So while um, us and I'm sure all our all other insurance companies also will try and reach out to the customers once this immediate panic situation, um, people come to grips with it. Um, and hopefully with a lag, they will pay their premiums and we are able to uh, reinstate their policies. Uh, but really, we don't know how long and how, so we're just being a little bit conservative here. Yeah, also IRB, you would know that they've given an extra window to pay. So they extended the grace period. So people may just avail of that extended grace period. So, uh, you know, policies that where the premiums were probably due, due in April and most of them would pay by May earlier. Now in the new scenario, they may actually pay up in June. So uh, since the situation is evolving, we were a little bit more cautious in setting the assumptions. In spite of the fairly positive uh, experience we've seen in uh, in the various segments. Okay, so final short uh, question. Mr. Kariwal, uh, sorry to interrupt, sir, but if you have any follow-up request to rejoin the queue, please. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. Uh, Mr. Kariwala, uh, so let me go ahead with your question. No, I was just trying to check uh, uh, the persistency numbers that have been given. Is that as of uh, 11 month uh, ending or that also incorporates March with uh, some grace period? This is for the 12 month ending uh, February. So it's from uh, okay. uh, previous that's March right. to February, uh, Sumit. Okay. Uh, that's only that's 12 month number because the yeah. up to March numbers will only come in around this time. Clear. Very clear. Thanks, Neeraj. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Arshit Toshniwal from Kringji Invest. Please go ahead. 
Hi, sir. Okay, guys, I've been got uh, one question. So, uh, in the retail protection, can we get some color on the, the policy ticket sizes and number of policies uh, within FI20 and 19? And and uh, how do you think that uh, changing? Because we have taken the reinsurance rate hike, uh, but simultaneously there is a there is a demand for lower ticket size policy. So, some color around around growth uh, on that aspect. Yeah, so um, it's not necessarily that for protection it's a lower ticket size. I'm saying uh, my comments are more in terms of for savings it's a lower ticket size. For okay. protection we're not really saying a lower ticket size. Okay. But if okay. you but if you want to if you want the numbers maybe Neeraj you can just uh, pass on the numbers on ticket size. Look at the Actually, so yeah, go ahead. From a ticket size perspective, one big shift that we've seen uh, over the last few quarters is uh, the switch to limited pay, which is now a significant part of the business, where uh, customers are actually preferring to uh, pay in a shorter span of time and have a coverage over a longer period of time. So that way they get done with the commitment sooner, but the coverage continues for a longer period of time. So that, uh, as, as you would appreciate, mm -hmm. has only in increased the ticket size uh, significantly over the past uh, a few quarters. So. Right. Uh, Lower ticket size, I mean, we, we can see demand coming through various uh, modes. Some people might actually prefer return of premium because they believe that uh, the value doesn't come to them in case nothing happens. Some people may actually want to take a decision every year in terms of how relevant the coverage is. So the, the thing is that we are offering all of these options, and depending on uh, a particular customer's thinking in terms of how he or she wants to go about it, as well as in terms of the environment, what you just mentioned right now. So we don't know which way the demand will evolve. We have all these options available, and, and, and we are happy to kind of uh, offer all of them to customers. Oh. Okay, sir. Yeah, and, and final point I had there, Harshit, is that if I were to look at March exit rate ticket size, mm -hmm. uh, and that has grown overall by about 19%. So, okay. uh, so for protection, it hasn't. We are not really seeing that that has gone down, but savings is go has gone down. Okay. Got it, ma'am. Thank you. Thank yeah, you sure. Thank you. The next question is from line of Avinash Singh from SBI Cap Securities. Please go ahead. Mr. Singh, your line is in talk mode. If you have muted yourself from the answer, kindly unmute yourself, please. Yeah, hi. Hi, uh, uh, quickly two questions. Uh, one, if you can please provide that 10 billion or almost five and a half percent of economic, negative economic variances in your EV walkthrough, what is the contribution of the reference rate going down and what's the impact of equity market fall? And the second one is that if I look, uh, put together the revenue account and shareholder account, uh, total uh, bad investment provision for the full year this year is almost close to 8 billion. That was last year, almost just one billion. So apart from yes tax, year one, what are the other, uh, yeah, if you want, what are the other key names there? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Shini, do you want to take the first part yes, and maybe I, followed by yeah, the I yeah. yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so largely, um, the um, the fall in the equity market is um, uh, sort of more uh, pronounced um, uh, than the upside and the upside from the fall in the yields. Uh, so by and large, you'll see a uh, 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 more sort of a, a dominant effect uh, from equities on the VIS component close to around um, seven, eight hundred crores, uh, and then uh, you have a little bit of this um, uh, an eighty-one bonds effect uh, of another hundred crores. Uh, and uh, but the upside from falling means primarily on the uh, A and W side. I mean the um, the net worth uh, is only about hundred crores or so. So a large effect is actually due to the fall in the equities, uh, and you know the fall in equities is uh, is felt uh, primarily in the UL uh, uh, in the UL products where the loss of future uh, fund management charges as a result of the lower equity uh, is uh, is the uh, main uh, reason for the uh, that itself is around 500 crores of the uh, thousand crores fall that you see there. Uh, and uh, around 200 crores is uh, because of the uh, equity fall impact on the shareholder funds. Uh, so there, so uh, mainly it is the equity fall and a little bit of upside uh, uh, coming through from the uh, drop in the um, yield curve. And uh, Neeraj, do you want to, want to just talk about the impairment? Uh, yes. Uh, so, in terms of impairment, the number that you mentioned is broken down into shareholder and policyholder. So, for policyholder, it's in the region of about uh, uh, 560.
because the because of the strengthening of the assumptions I talked about earlier uh, in the persistency, uh, the uh, the EV itself has, uh, has taken a hit because of the assumptions changes, and uh, because the EV itself has come down, any stresses on a reduced EV would actually come down correspondingly. So the um, uh, the sensitivity is actually lower uh, on the persistency from uh, what was the case earlier. So it's not actually gone up. So I don't know which one you're comparing. So, but I'm uh, talking to uh, sensitivity to VNV and not EV. Uh, why it has uh, you know moved up, and if you could give some color even for tax uh, and on the uh, reference rate as well. So when you say it's gone up, uh, do you uh, I mean uh, the, uh, I'm saying the VNV? Yeah, the sensitivities are higher. So it was it is 0.5 and 0.6. So you're saying it was higher from the previous quarter, you mean, or which uh, you mean, say higher? Higher from uh, the what? last published sensitivity. What was there? Right. Um, I may need to check because I my understanding is it should actually. So if I give out the number, last persistency sensitivity was 0.8 minus 0.8 and uh, for increase in 10 percent and plus 0.6 for decrease in 10 percent. Uh, yeah. Now it has gone up to minus 2.1 and 2.1 uh, for increase and discrete, uh, decrease respectively. Even the tax rate sensitivity has moved up from 17.4 negative to minus 20, uh, and the reference rate has also gone up. So just wanted to understand this. Right. So Shri, there would be a change in product mix to some extent, and also the assumption changes. So you could maybe refer to that then. Uh, Probably I can connect uh, after the call on this. Uh, the other thing uh, which I wanted to check is on the effective tax rate. Uh, has that been factored in and what is the impact, if any? On Neil, you want to have a go? Yes. So that, that's that been done. In fact, we discussed this at the time of uh, this whole uh, budget uh, situation as well. So the effective tax rate uh, for us, in fact, uh, this time has, has uh, gone down and whatever changes that we expect uh, in the 521 have already been factored into our embedded value and our BNB. So uh, this time the ETR, our uh, effective tax rate was lower because of uh, uh, lower surplus due to higher growth and uh, higher dividend income that we received. So we had a lower effective tax rate this year. FI21, mm -hmm. because of the uh, abolishment of uh, DDT, uh, the impact of that uh, we stated uh, earlier as well is about 0.2% uh, on our uh, EV, uh, VNB and about 0.2% on our uh, EV. Sorry, 0.2 on VNB and 0.2 on, uh, on EV, or on negative side, right? Yeah, on the negative side, 0.3% on VNB and 0.2% on EV. Okay, thank you so much. That's it for my here. The next question is from the lineup, Ravi Naredi from Naredi Investment. Please go ahead. Hello, ma'am. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, just uh, would like to know how much reinsurance we are doing and whom we do this insurance. So we have various um, various uh, uh, reinsurance companies with whom we have treaty agreements. Uh, and uh, the amount that we retain also varies from different lines of business. Um, so what we retain, for example, on um, on our individual protection is very different from what we uh, would retain on our some of our savings product. Uh, and we also have a quota share. So it is quite a, a quite varied in terms of different lines of business. So this and, reinsurance and the reason for the increase, the reason for the increase in reinsurance premium that you see is largely because of us writing more protection business. Okay. And this reinsurance we are doing from Indian companies or foreign companies? We do from all companies. Whoever is willing to work with us, we do it. Okay. And ma'am, income from investment is lost around 10,229 crore. Will you highlight what is the matter? Yes, because uh, everything is on track except the mark-to-market uh, loss due to the equity markets having fallen by about 26%. Uh, and that okay. is in the range of 12,000 crore. We are required by regulation to whatever portfolio that we have, the 1.24 trillion or 1,24,000 crores, that we have to mark to market at least uh, in terms of whatever the prices, prevailing uh, rates are as of uh, 31st of March. Uh, and this is nothing but the mark to market uh, loss that you see. And uh, the, the reason for this is basically because uh, insurance companies need to recognize premium as revenue. 
and uh, any change in that is basically coming as either increase or decrease in revenue or income. Uh, what happens here is that if the markets are down and the income is shown as lower, that would uh, also reduce your reserves and liability to the same extent. So the impact on PNL is uh, really a second order effect of any uh, lower FMC on a lower base. Okay, okay. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sanket Goda from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just, just I wanted a clarity that since we have not taken the uh, entire pass on of the reinsurance rate to the end customer, uh, just wanted you told that there will be different strategies to maintain make it margin neutral. So just wanted to understand few which could help us to understand that the margins could be maintained in protection business. Yeah, so first of all, you know, our product Sanket is awaiting uh, regulatory approval. So whether we will pass it on or not and how much we pass it on, right now it's on the drawing board. Um, but as and when we get the, get the approval, uh, that's when um, in the past, because we do believe that um, just because reinsurers are charging us more does not mean that the, you know, customer uh, should automatically be charged everything to retain margin. So we have to find other other ways. And some of those ways are, uh, in, in product mix is one. Uh, even if you look at on par itself, uh, our uh, margins on par without uh, really uh, giving specific numbers have expanded 150 basis points. So there are different ways of uh, just stretching uh, margins. Uh, there's also uh, bringing down the cost of acquisition. Um, there is also um, some uh, <coughs> So in terms of how much we retain on books that we feel fairly comfortable, so we don't have to necessarily reinsure every part of our business and so on. So it is, you know, we have four or five uh, different kinds of levers, some big, some small, for us to be able to um, cushion the, the the part that we don't pass on. Okay, so, so basically it means that probably if, if you don't pass on the rate hike completely, we might take a bit of hit on the protection margin, but it should be compensated by the better margins in the saving side, like uh, by the, by increasing the margins in power business or more retaining or cost of acquisition coming down kind of a thing. Uh, is my understanding so right? Yeah, so we uh, always take a portfolio approach. Um, so we look at port portfolio margins rather than at a segment level. Because ultimately, it's at a company level margin, and there will always be, be these pushes and pulls. Yeah, and just uh, one more thing which I wanted to understand is that uh, our VNB margin uh, assumption changes to 60 bits, negative 60 bits, uh, but 20 bits is coming from uh, coming from effective tax rate. So, just wanted to understand what where is that 40 bits coming from, and and similarly, that operating assumption changes of 1.2 billion rupees what we made in in the EV, uh, can we get that broader breakup uh, into effective tax rate, cost, and persistency? Neil, you want to start off on that? Yes, if you uh, look at the uh, PNB sensitivities. Uh, uh, I'm referring to page number 35 with respect to VNB, where okay. you say that VNB margin is uh, uh, is impacted by 60 bits because of the assumption change. I understand point two is coming from effective tax rate. So I just wanted to understand where that 40 bits is coming from. And second, with respect to the EV waterfall chart, which is in page number uh, page number uh, 10, then where where operating assumption changes is minus 0.2. So so I believe some portion is uh, effective tax rate. And where is the other part coming from? So uh, we mentioned earlier on the call as well. Uh, so what we've done is uh, this time, but, uh, Effective tax rate is one, but also we mentioned that we've strengthened our assumptions. Assumptions are both in terms of uh, mortality as well as in terms of persistency. So uh, what we've done is that uh, we've uh, reviewed the experience of uh, March uh, that's happened post-COVID. Uh, we've also taken some sort of uh, uh, estimates uh, in terms of uh, how we believe persistency will pan out uh, going forward. Shini alluded to that in terms of uh, actual persistency versus uh, the, the stresses that we've taken. So some part of it, uh, large part of it is obviously on the back book, which is uh, reflecting in the uh, WIF uh, change. But uh, the business written in the past 12 months also has to be given impact, or rather has to be okay. given effect to. So that is what you see as uh, uh, the assumption change in the VNB as well, in addition to uh, ETR and in addition to uh, uh, the COVID reserve. So that's that's basically the... Uh, on the VNB side. As far as uh, uh, EV is concerned, if you can, I'm sorry, if you could just repeat your question, sorry. 
No, no, uh, I know broadly I think uh, you have answered it with respect to this also that 1.2 billion is combination of effective tax rate, persistency strengthening and COVID reserve strengthening. That, that's that's, uh, that's, that's yeah. so basically we've yeah. given effect to the entire book, not just uh, the past but also the last 12 months. So we split exactly. that into the two parts, yes. And this is just in slide number 21, this is a little counterintuitive that the, when the interest rates are going up by 100 basis points, uh, we, our margins on VNB uh, VN, uh, margins are showing negative for a non-power business. Actually, you will end up earning more. So, net-net, uh, your margin should be positive with respect uh, rather than being negative. I am failing to understand that point. If you, if you can give a clarity, that would be really useful. Yeah, so typically what would happen is that if you are unhedged, then when interest rates go up, you will get higher margins out of your non-power book. And if interest rates oh. down, obviously you will see a lot uh, lower margins. In our case, given that we are uh, fully hedged and not just on duration but on cash flows, uh, and we have locked in our earnings through either assets that we bought or through FRA that, that we've locked yeah. in, uh, that's how the sign change is uh, uh, possible in our case. And that, in fact, is actually giving us more comfort and it should give more comfort to investors as well that when interest rates actually go down, which is what people think will happen over the medium to long term, uh, the margins will only see an upside. Got it. Fair enough. And uh, finally, just uh, on your Mr. credit Wood. protect. Okay, no problem. I will take it uh, subsequently. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vinod Raja Rami, Raja Mani from HSBC. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, uh, I had a question on the um, uh, in your EV walk uh, that uh, 10 billion number which you have talked about in terms of the operating uh, variance. If you could just give a split in terms of how much is um, uh, related to uh, equity and how much is it uh, related to debt. Shini, you want to you have the handy? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's uh, broadly about um, 900 crores would be um, uh, would be equity. And if you classify 81 bonds as equity, that will be another uh, 100 crores. But there is a slight contra uh, uh, movement on the debt side as well. So broadly, a significant proportion of 1,000 crores is actually equity. Okay. Thanks. And um, uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the the tax rate change, what is the impact uh, in the operating uh, variance uh, 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 that you'll have in terms of the EV walk as well as the new business value walk? Yes, so we did discuss it. it is in the range of 0.2 to 0.3 percent. Okay, sure. Thanks. Yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. A reminder to the participants, please limit your questions to one per participant. Should you have any follow-up, request to rejoin the queue, please. The next question is from the line of Nidhi Jain, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm from Investec. Uh, so, uh, with respect to... Uh, the credit light business, which uh, uh, is most likely to see a decline in FI21. Uh, so, and we have, were hedging our uh, non par portfolio. We are doing cash flow hedge using credit light for inflows. So, do you see a change in hedging strategy uh, going into FI21? And uh, will there be a consequent impact on your ability to underwrite non par savings business and offer uh, uh, the levels of guarantee that we were doing historically? So, Nidesh, I, uh, I'll just start off and then Neeraj can add. Uh, so, you know, we, we have been mentioning that uh, credit life uh, as a portfolio at the beginning when FRAs are not allowed, uh, that's when it, they, it came in handy. Today, it is no longer the only way that we hedge our non-power portfolio. There are uh, various other that partly paid bonds as well as, like I mentioned, um, FRAs themselves. Uh, and this uh, aids in both uh, ALM as well as cash flow, hedge, uh, cash flow matching. Um, so, so it is not that everything is only dependent on credit life, which yes, I, and we do agree with you. Apart from certain parts of um, the, the lending environment, most of it is in a fairly bearish mode. Anything, Anira, you want to add? No, you covered it. Just, just a couple of very quick things. So, there are two things here. One is in terms of the rate and second is in terms of the amount of business. Now, rate is not really dependent on any of the hedging instruments. It's really dependent on what's available in the economy and uh, based on our ability to take any credit risk, lock in the rates. So, the rates that will be available to customers will be completely based on that, as you've seen in the past, with our dynamic repricing, both in uh, Sanjay Plus as well as in annuities. As far as the amount of business is concerned, uh, with the added avenues that we have for hedging, we do not see that to be a constraint. But, uh, of course, we will... Uh, uh, monitor our ability to write new business on uh, on the basis of the ability to hedge as well. Whichever instrument uh, is effective, we will use that. 
And if at any point in time any of these become a constraint, of course, we will monitor our product mix. But like you said in the past, uh, our willingness to write this uh, business uh, is, is more governed by our uh, balanced product mix approach. So every quarter you see us bring down this uh, business to a particular level, so that approach will continue. Sure. And secondly, from a product mix perspective, if I look at uh, 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 over the next two to three years, uh, I think uh, one should not expect a further increase in non-fast savings as percentage of overall uh, uh, mix. So hence, from here onwards, the margin improvement lever is largely from NUP and protection. Uh, is that a right understanding or do you see margin improvement levers in the savings business also? We definitely see them in uh, savings as well. And if we get health, even more so. So, you know, uh, it, uh, we don't want to be slotted into it's either this or that as whatever is visible today. There are so many other product innovations that we can do which could be hybrid uh, between different segments. Um, technology is something that we have just scratched the surface in terms of how we offer. So it's not just what we sell but also how we sell. So we, we feel uh, fairly enthused over... Uh, a lot of these innovations that uh, that, are, that would be first to the market. And so it, it somewhat will become not as important as to slotting it into protection, being the only savior or um, reducing something else or putting a cap on non-power. Or, so, um, so it's a combination of both uh, a technology as well as product innovation. Sure. sure. And just lastly on the operating variances, if you can share the breakup uh, in terms of persistency, mortality, expenses, and others, uh, that would be very uh, helpful. Sini, you want to give a color on that? Sorry, uh, can you repeat the question, oh, no. please? Operating variance is uh, giving more details on that. Right. So, operating variance is, um, uh, you know, uh, largely the... Um, uh, and the persistency variance and mortality and uh, expense variance. Uh, so by and large, uh, we are positive uh, on every one of them. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, because of uh, the uh, uh, various initiatives we put in place uh, to strengthen the um, 13th month persistency and mortality as, uh, due to uh, optimal uh, reinsurance um, uh, protection we've got, uh, and also cost uh, control, uh, and all these things have resulted in various aspects of the operating variance uh, broadly, you know, uh, within our assumptions. Um, but like I said, in spite of the operating variance being favorable, uh, we have uh, decided to strengthen the, uh, the few assumptions, uh, primarily on account of the uncertainties uh, resulting from uh, the COVID crisis we are going through. Uh, but as things pan out over the next uh, quarter, or two, uh, we will see whether there is any merit to unwind any of those assumptions. Sure, sure. And these operating... Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, sure. Uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. Thank you. Sure. The next question is from Lainam Davalgada from DSP Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Vibha. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, operating cost and uh, its ability to sort of uh, help in this uh, time on the margins? Uh, just how much ability do we have on the cost front? Uh, to maintain margins and improve them. And the second is, uh, I missed the uh, comment that uh, Neeraj made around uh, the amount of uh, sort of uh, additions we made uh, related to persistency. So if you could just quantify that. Yeah, those are two questions. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So if you were to look at um, uh, the, the breakup of the cost, uh, about 26% odd is our um, employee-related cost. About 50% uh, is uh, all distributor and new business sales variable cost. Um, so if you were to uh, see what are all the controllable versus non-controllable costs uh, and leave the employee costs as is because um, the need of the hour is to have uh, a little bit more of empathy. Um, so like I said, 50-55% sales variable. There's also volume-related cost, which is another 7% which is all your things like SAM duty and medical and uh, uh, those sorts of things. Again, uh, new business related. So that is 62%. Uh, and uh, when you have your fixed cost, which is your infrastructure, uh, your uh, technology investments, which is about 10, 12%. Uh, so um, 
62 to 65% is almost entirely variable that just leaves about 35 to 38% that we have to deal with in the event of a slowdown because that's what i'm assuming that uh, you are alluding to and even within yeah. that things like branches uh, so we have 421 branches we have a plan as we speak today as to if this is uh, if if covid-19 takes a very long time to uh, to really for us for no, no, normalcy to come back as of today we are um, able to service our customers like i said in my opening comments as to the, you know the number of claims and the 300 death claims and the 21000 annuity settlements etc so there's, so there's virtually nothing that we are not able to do today um, which means that we are in a position to be able to roll this out reasonably for good uh, and which means that we might not require that many touch points of course this will be subject to our, some of our conversations with the regulator but uh, the point is in terms of if there is that much of deep pain and for the survival uh, of the sector, some of those measures might become uh, very, very um, uh, pertinent. But as of today, so we want to have a very calibrated approach. Uh, all the homework is done as of almost a fortnight back uh, of what we need to do in which scenarios. We have three scenarios that we have worked out on and we will wait and watch and react uh, as those scenarios uh, hopefully don't pan out uh, because we also need to have a, an eye on uh, when growth starts coming back, uh, we we have good people, we have um, good investments made, and it's very easy to roll back, but uh, more difficult to build once again. So really, it needs to be in a calibrated manner. But uh, like I said, the homework has been done, and we are ready with plans under the different scenarios. Understood. And uh, just uh, uh, on the uh, sorry to interrupt, sir, but for any follow-up request to rejoin the queue, please. Sure, sure, Next yeah. question is from the line of mission from Kotak. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, just two things. Uh, one was, uh, you know, if you could give a breakup of, uh, I, I actually dropped off in between, but if you could give, give us a breakup of the operating balance of 150 crores and uh, just on the investment balance of 1,000 crores, I think uh, somehow, you know, compare, looking at the sensitivity that you put out last quarter, I think it doesn't really add up. And uh, second one was on the COVID-2019 uh, kind of results, you know, what kind of uh, impact do you really see on the business? Uh, Srini, you want to have a go at Yeah. See, uh, I think the same question got asked uh, a while ago from someone. Um, so the uh, operating variance on all the uh, parameters, uh, they are positive. Uh, they add up to around 150 crores, uh, and every one of them is uh, positive. Um, on the um, investment uh, variance, uh, I was saying earlier that uh, out of 1,000 crores, uh, broadly around uh, uh, 700, uh, sorry, uh, 900 crores is uh, due to equity fault. Uh, and if you classify 81 bonds as uh, equity, then uh, it is another 100 crores fault due to equity. Uh, and remaining uh, small amount is due to debts. The debt you should have a positive, right? Yeah, very small positive, but you know, you have a, a counter because it is, I don't know how you classify the 81 bonds and all, but, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, that's action, uh, that diminution. So, uh, yeah, so the debts you'll get a positive because of the drop in the yield curve, uh, but that's not as much, uh, as it, uh, because that's it's more than counter I mean, are you suggesting that's what offset by the credit downgrades? No, uh, since you have the EV uh, on a risk-free uh, curve, the, the EV is always at a, on a risk-free basis. You don't get credits for any, uh, you know, uh, so it's on RFR basis, uh, the risk-free um, uh, curve that we use for valuing EV. So there are, there is, but when, when you actually have a market crash or uh, bonds uh, not sort of, you know, having a, um, a repayment issue like in the S1, S Bank 81, then there will be a, a actual downgrade or a diminution. So, uh, but uh, of the thousand crores, uh, uh, predominantly more than 900 crores is due to equity fall. Sure. Just and on uh, COVID-2019, if you could just uh, kind of maybe, yeah. maybe maybe put some numbers to, you know, what you're really looking yeah. at. So, COVID, COVID reserves, uh, we've set up around 40-odd crores for COVID, and that mm -hmm. is based on, uh, uh, you know, what the actual spread of the pandemic across the country uh, and we mapped that uh, geographical spread uh, with our number of lives where we have written uh, in the uh, across various uh, states and, um, uh, and cities and we also overlaid the um, you know the age profile because COVID typically affects 
uh, a certain uh, uh, you know uh, age band uh, so may mainly say 45 50 year plus plus comorbidities you know people who have diabetes or hypertension so we uh, we sort of classified uh, uh, the various uh, pockets of um, our book and compared that with the actual spread of the pandemic uh, in the country and uh, we also take an account of the um, you know various age bands in which people have fall under and accordingly come up with this number of uh, around 40 or crores uh, which translates to around uh, 4500 or extra lives uh, that we have provided for uh, due to covid sure thank you thank you the next question is from the line of mayan gurediwala from franklin templeton please go ahead hey uh, hi thanks for uh, taking my question um i i just uh, have a follow up on those disclosures that you have provided on the uh, non par guaranteed book the three stress scenario tests that you have done and i understand under every scenario the equity value uh, on that particular book remains positive uh, but i want to understand that under which of these scenarios uh, while the equity value is positive we would start seeing significant negative uh, variances versus what we have already assumed on to the next so uh, frank uh, uh, basically uh, this net asset liability position is is uh, reflective of uh, change in uh, shareholder value or the volatility in that uh, we i mean if your question was around equity values there is no equity that we hold in this uh, portfolio it's all debt so uh, this what you see net net uh, asset liability position change is basically the uh, upwards or downward change in that given any of these stress scenarios so uh, that's that's uh, that's what this indicates and if you see it uh, in conjunction with the earlier slide uh, it tells you the impact at an overall level uh, it gives you impact for the entire non par uh, portfolio on base case interest change uh, interest rate changes as well so these are the three additional uh, stress scenarios that we've taken which combines uh, or rather talks about a higher uh, change in interest rate and combining with uh, demographic changes as well in terms of uh, persistency so this is uh, the change in uh, shareholder value in case these changes do happen got it understood um uh, also in term i'll ask a final follow up request to the region the queue please the next question is from the line of shreya shivani from clsa india private limited please go ahead yeah thank you for for the opportunity uh, i have two questions uh, first is on the guaranteed product the non par savings product so can you give some light on what is the uh, current guaranteed irr that you are offering and how much cut have we taken overall uh, with the first product which was launched back in march 19 to now and uh, how much demand i mean uh do you think the demand of this product over fi 21 keeping in mind that it is a year impacted by pandemic so uh, what is your demand outlook on this product and my second question is on the unwind rate um so i wanted to understand if the fi 20 unwind rate is based as of march 20 or is it based as of march 19 because i see that the unwind rate has come down to 7.5% now so if you can help me understand this and uh, any guidance on how it will be going ahead thank you So as far as uh, demand for uh, non-par is concerned, it's uh, you have to see it. And so before that, in terms of repricing, we repriced uh, our product uh, uh, numerous times. We've discussed this whether it's annuity or the non-par product. We started with offering guaranteed rates uh, of uh, around six percent when the interest rates were in the eight percent range, and uh, we've, we've kept these uh, in line with what's available in the market, and uh, ensuring that our spread is enough to. manage our risk expenses and margins so we we kind of maintain that from a demand perspective uh, we do not see this uh, uh, in in absolute terms we need to see it in relative terms and when interest rates go down in the economy they will also affect fixed deposit rates savings bank rates uh, small savings rates as we've seen recently so uh, what our product needs to compete with is with all of these instruments uh, and on a tax adjusted basis uh, the proposition still remains attractive so in an uncertain in an uncertain environment even if interest rates go down uh, the demand for this product uh, category should be fairly uh, healthy uh, how much we want to do will depend on what we all discussed earlier in the uh, in, in in terms of maintaining a balanced product mix and ensuring that the portfolio is always fully hedged uh, 
As far as uh, the unwind is concerned, we did mention that uh, interest rates have come off uh, in the 90 to 110 basis points range over the last uh, year, and our unwind rate, which was in the 8.5% uh, range, has come down to about 7.5, 7.6. So it's about, uh, uh, it, it kind of completely reflects uh, the change that has happened uh, in the uh, interest rate uh, scenario over the last 12 months. Sure, understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Rishabh Parekh from Sindhi Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, I had two questions. One is, Viva, uh, how are you seeing the behavior till date of renewal post this COVID crisis? Are you seeing a sharp reduction? While I appreciate that you have taken, uh, you have strengthened your uh, persistency assumptions, but just how has the behavior been on the ground is my first question. And my second question is the persistency. I just heard a previous caller ask if the persistency was only to February because the March data would be coming out now. So all the just wanted to clarify if all the persistencies mentioned in the presentation were to February and not March. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Rishab. Um, yes. What we are beginning to see is that um, there is a slowdown. Uh, how much is a slowdown? Um, anything up between 40 to 50 percent uh, in terms of delayed collections is what we are saying. Um, is it alarming? Uh, we need to see because uh, it could also be a function of the fact that they have uh, now one more month to pay premium uh, while we are still counselling people and reaching out uh, to say that um, pay your premiums on time. Um, so, um, but, but as of now, there is a strong, uh, like I mentioned, uh, cash conservation. To your second uh, question, yes, it's as of February. Uh, and so just want to understand, is this, this is the kind of experience that we have baked into our uh, uh, operating assum uh, assumption uh, strengthening. Is that, would that be fair to assume? We have baked that into our assumption strengthening and more so on unit link. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pawan from IFL. Please go ahead. Thank you, ma'am, for the opportunity. Uh, my question is on the future growth of the business. Like you mentioned that you will be looking at protection as the main focus area. And also mentioned that the North or when the interest rates have reduced, it still remains competitive with respect to what are the other pro products in the market available. But if you look at the savings, pro uh, the protection product, you know, it has become like race to bottom with all the other players coming in and focusing more and more on the protection. Like every call you attend, everyone says that protection is their new focus product. ULIPs are out of favor because of the market conditions. And non-power, while you say that it still remains attractive, the interest rates are regularly going down year over year. I mean, at least over the last one year. So looking at next three to five years, what would be the like focus areas for the growth? Where would the growth be coming from? Thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I'll start off and maybe Suresh, you can add. Yeah. Um, we... we um, and even my earlier comments, um, we don't believe that protection is the only lever uh, and, and protection is the only way forward for insurance. There is a reason why in India, savings-led insurance made a lot of sense. Uh, and even today, if I were to look at um, who are my customers and who is buying insurance, there is a sizable population that's about, say, 48 years uh, of age. Uh, and, uh, and perhaps not still uh, uh, a happy convert to only buying protection. Um, and so we are a firm believer that uh, we are catering to India and Bharat uh, and want to penetrate into um, into smaller ticket sizes, uh, more into hinterland, more into non salary class. Uh, and that's when all parts of our offering become very, very relevant, including, say, participating products. And participating products today, especially our uh, Sanjay Power Advantage, is uh, uh, significantly uh, more uh, accretive uh, to the bottom line than, than uh, maybe other asset classes and so on. So, and there is a place under the sun because uh, there is, it makes sense for a risk averse um, policy holder who wants very little exposure to equity and, and so on, uh, like money back schemes, etc., with a life cover. So, uh, a balanced product mix is something we will continue to focus on. We've been saying that for a long time. So, we'll continue to focus on that. Credit life is something that uh, as long as we price it sensibly, because there also we are beginning to see a lot of irrational behavior, and we are actually beginning uh, to exit some of the relationships because, again, there's a race to the bottom because of the kind of pricing either to the distributor or 
uh, to um, uh, or in terms of um, how cheap you make the product uh, and not really covering your um, the kind of claims experience that one is seeing, especially in MFI. And so, um, so, so and GTI also is making uh, a lot of sense to us. Uh, health through on the group platform is making a lot of sense. Uh, pension continues. This is the first time we've introduced a slide. Maybe uh, it was too early uh, in terms of the call, but uh, pension is another uh, different way of looking at longevity risk. Um, so for us, it is uh, many tongs in the fire as against only protection. Suresh, you want to add something? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, you covered it. But just to share with you, I think, uh, one of the things that we see is an opportunity across mortality, humidity, and longevity. Uh, we have probably the maximum range of products which we have been selling to on goal base. So if you were to really look at our customer base, it's not that there is no opportunity for ULIP even in this market. So there is a set of customers who have seen a correction who probably need to rebalance their portfolio. A lot of the customers who are looking at non-power products still see us as compared to many other asset classes. You know, even for the earlier questions to come, a lot of uh, the customers who had invested in non-power products at higher interest rates earlier, you can see very high persistency which will probably remain. So, you know, we don't see that as there. Similarly, in terms of protection, I don't think customers out there are only going to go just based on pricing. A lot of the uh, decisions by the customer depend on claim rates, depends on which company, which brand, what are the features of the particular product. And we do believe there is a lot of innovation which can happen in terms, even just not the vanilla product, in terms of being able to cover. So we're not really worried about the markets. Like Viva said that, look, there are the annuity market and the annuity segment in that age group. Even if you were to look at our own customer base, the opportunity to upsell and cross-sell is so large that we can go back to a certain set of customers and sell any of these products. So we don't really see a worry in terms of which pool we want to remain profitable, but I do think that look, there is enough opportunity out there to reach out to a lot of customers who anyway are getting more ever and inclined towards life insurance now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Hitesh Arora from Unify Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, could you give a sense of the business that was lost due to COVID in the last, say, 15-16 uh, calendar days of the financial year? And the uh, second was, uh, you know, uh, because of the medical checkup, uh, you know, it's not possible these days. Do you limit at what uh, Sama showed uh, do you, are you going for with currently? And that, what is, how do you tackle that? So there's some lost business there as well, right? So how do you tackle that? Yeah, so on that, uh, in terms of um, loss of revenue, about 1,000 to 1,100 crores of new business and renewal premium put together is our estimate. Uh, so Rish, you want to add anything? Uh, in, in, I mean, in terms of, say, uh, would be in terms of VNB, what would be the number? Um, you can assume a similar kind of a product mix. Okay, uh, so this time would uh, apply with the margin? This, this I'm talking about both new business and renewal put together. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is Anup Pratik from Nepal Asset Management. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, hi. Hello. Yeah, hi, ma'am. Yes. I'm just one. I was just thinking this. Uh, there are two, uh, if I may say, headwinds uh, for us this year, which would be, as you just talked about, credit life being a muted year because of lower disbursement growth. And secondly, on the protection side, uh, the reinsurance costs might be passed on in a graded manner or you would look at alternative strategies. And given that this, the protection segment for us, when it comes to VNB, is a substantial part. I'm just thinking as to uh, if you could, you know, uh, again, a, a talk, of some clarity as to how will this get compensated when it comes to VNB margins because, as I said, this is a substantial part of your VNB. And second is, ma'am, in your individual protection, I see growth of 23% on a YOY basis, but given that share of limited pay would be higher, uh, could you also talk about in terms of number of policies, what kind of growth have you seen? Thank you. Yeah, so um, you asked two, three questions. So, uh, I, if I recall, the first question is, is in terms of your... Um, uh, VMB um, and what your protection could have is, is that, was that your first question? No, my first question was that uh, your protection is a VMB is, is a dominant I mean within your VMB protection is a dominant part and there Not are two as, headwinds. No, uh, so I just want to uh, it is it is an important part 
but not necessarily a dominant part. Now I recall in terms of your credit life, in fact, the credit life slowdown will actually be some of and are exiting some of the partnerships like I talked about, wherein there is irrational pricing or the trends on mortality. Uh, absolutely, uh, we are unable to price those kind of trends. Uh, it will be margin accretive uh, rather than depleted. So, um, so that's on credit life. Uh, from, margin, from a margin perspective, not absolute perspective, I'm assuming, because uh, the lower margin product. No, even on that, even on even on absolute uh, VNB, because some of this are, are loss making. Okay. Okay. Right. So, and that's why we want to exit. Otherwise, we won't exit it. Uh, it just doesn't make sense at all. And there's no roadmap also for us to get some clarity as to when are we likely to uh, and if we are going to uh, break even at all. Right. Sure. And the last. Uh, yeah. Last and the question, yeah, the question was on limited pay. Uh, uh, could you just split the growth of your individual protection into number of policies versus ticket size? If it's, it's possible. Um, Neeraj, do you have that uh, information ready? Otherwise, you can give it to yourself. Yeah, I think we'll just uh, connect offline, please, for this. Sure. So, and Vipa, what is family policy density and client policy density? This is on slide 32. Just give me a second. Some additional customer insights. I'm assuming these yeah. customer insights are based on your own customers, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is this, These are all our own in, insights. Yeah. So, so what is family policy density? So Three point. How do you define so it? This is the number of people in that family. So on average, close to four people. And client, client policy density is what? So this is wherein... Um, this, this will be at a unique customer context. level and what will be there in the overall family. So you could have various policies in a particular yeah, family so, across yeah. multiple products. Correct. And for client policy is that where we have upsold to that client. So 1.3 policies is the average policy that our customers have. And 3.7 is per family? Per family, yeah. Ma'am, so then the uh, potential to farm is lower than hunt, right? Now, because if there are four policies per family for your customer, that incrementally you'll have to add new customers. Is that the way to think about it? Not really, because uh, not all of them, unfortunately, hold on to their policies. If you look at persistency data, um, that would be the case if they continue to pay their premiums. But shareholder surplus that comes uh, to shareholders, that's a la large chunk of uh, what uh, constitutes uh, shareholder uh, profit. And the second is uh, the investment income from the shareholders. So the investment income from shareholders is, is uh, much is a, is a lot higher than last year in the count on the, in terms of uh, dividend income as well as in terms of dividend. The gains on realization have been lower than last year. And of course, we've taken diminutions. So the policyholder surplus has flown through uh, from uh, our unit link book largely because of lower business and also in terms of uh, the regular uh, transfers from uh, the participating book and the surpluses that arise from the non-par as well. So uh, we've, we've had a good uh, year in terms of new business growth as well as uh, healthy rate and healthy growth and renewals in spite of the situation that we just uh, discussed. So all of that contributes uh, positively to the uh, shareholder uh, accounting profit as well. Okay. Okay. This is great. Uh, just so the last question. Uh, on Raja Kumar. Uh, sorry to interrupt, sir, but for any follow-up request, please join the queue, please. The next question is from the line of Jatin Jain, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, hi, Jatin. Hello. Uh, Ma'am, actually, my question is uh, that for the insurance companies, March is a very important month. So, due to the corona effect, how much uh, the percentage in the, uh, income has been affected if by compared to last year? Yes, so I can how, take how much of top line? Yeah, please go ahead. So, so you know, normally you are right. Uh, the last month of March has a fair percentage contribution to the overall business. But, okay. however, if you have seen over the last few years, the skew of the business which is done in the last quarter has started coming down. So if, if you remember when we had the post-budget discussions also, we came back and said, look, tax is probably not one of the largest reasons why people buy insurance, which is one of the reasons the skew has moved from Q4 to Q1, Q2, and Q3. However, March still remains significant as an overall in terms of percentage. So you would normally find that the last 15 days or the last two weeks of March contribute to anywhere between 8 to 10 percent or 8 percent of the annual number. Now, that is where more or less it has got affected. You would say in the industry, the impact would be around 6 to 7 percent of the annual numbers which have come in from the COVID last 15 days. So that would probably be proportionate across all 
And you would find that in March, most of the numbers, obviously the num- IRDA numbers have not been published, most of the insurers have degrown. We've probably degrown the least uh, in terms of what was our March. But uh-huh. an estimate would be anywhere between 300 to 400 crores of new business which have got impacted in the last 10 days of March. Okay. Uh, as I said, just uh, that uh, your company has degrown least in the insurance sector. So, can I assume that due to the, uh, the March effect, your profit is little down? It can be related? No, so actually the new business, the strain actually affects the profit a little bit more in the sense that the more business you do, there is some more of a strain. So, to some extent, the new business strain has actually come down because of a slightly lesser business. So, maybe Neeraj, you can add on that. But effectively, we are looking at significantly much higher numbers. If you have seen the year-on-year growth, which has stand for HTSC like amongst the large private sector players, it will stand out in the higher double digits. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. We take the last question from the line of Madhu Karlada from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. A couple of quick questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, that the equity hit was about 900 crores uh, on the VIF. Uh, so, uh, so this 900 crores is purely just because of the fund management charges on a lower equity value. That is the right way to read it, right? No, I said earlier, um, uh, fund manager, UL is only about 500 crores. Uh, then you have the equity uh, uh, impact on the shareholder network. That is about 200 crores. And then on okay, the participating is- products also, you have some equities. And if the equities fall, uh, the ability to pay the future bonuses from which you will actually get a shareholder transfer, they also fall. So it is a projection of how much the total uh, loss in the future transfers as bonus to the par customers also has a contributory effect in the uh, in fall, uh, fall so, of equities. So, but so the U.S. S&P alone is around the 500 crores and 200 crores so is around par. The shareholders. And 200 crore, another 200 crores is in the shareholder equity. Understood. Uh, and then uh, back to the non-par, uh, you know, additional disclosures that you've given. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the three scenarios, uh, our net asset position actually becomes, uh, uh, it's still positive, but uh, it is uh, it is slightly lower than what we have incorporated in our EV. Right, that's the right way of reading it, right? So the right way to look at it is basically the base EV captures our uh, best estimate assumptions of each of these uh, elements, whether it's uh, interest rate or uh, policyholder behavior. Uh, stresses in normal course are something that we put out in our sensitivity slide. These are severe stresses to one part of our portfolio. So the impact of which is mentioned at the bottom of page 21. Uh, and the results of these stresses are what you're talking about on page 22. Now, this is basically to give uh, the management, uh, board, shareholders, uh, and all of us comfort that uh, even if there are severe stresses, what is the movement in the value of the shareholders? That is uh, what this uh, tells you. Because if you look at any extreme stresses, for example, if equity markets go down by 30%, the impact on embedded value and BNB will be higher than what it would be in normal course. Now, that's obviously going to be the case. Interest rates fall by 3%, it will affect the portfolio in, in different ways from what it would affect if interest rates fall by 1%. So this is basically the severity of the test. If you were to look at it in terms of the regular sensitivities that you do, uh, sensitivities, like Shini explained, have in fact come down across each of those elements, whether it's persistency, interest rate, because of a balanced portfolio. Yeah, but th- this is, uh, this minus four, uh, so minus, you know, 4.5% or minus 7% is on a baseline EB which we have, in, uh, on a baseline uh, sort of assumption that we have incorporated. So, uh, you know, what percentage would these two portfolios sort of contribute in our EV? So, uh, in terms of our uh, value of Enforce, that's uh, fairly well spread between uh, unit link participating and non-participating. So, the impact that you see is on this portfolio, which will be one portion of the uh, of the VIS. We are not talking about uh, how much of... Uh, uh, this is coming from each of these components, but is reasonably well distributed across uh, unit link participating and non-participating. And uh, what you see on page 21 is uh, the result of uh, uh, 
the interest rate that you would apply yeah. uh, on uh, interest rate. Right. right. All right. Th thank you. That will be it from my side. So. Thank you. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Vibha Padalkar for closing comments. Ms. Vibha. Apologies. Uh, I was on mute. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being part of this conference call. Stay safe. And if there's anything further in terms of clarifications, please do reach out to Kunal Jain from our IR team. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of HDFC Life Insurance Company Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.